I'm going to tell you kind of a big, long, meandering journey um, uh, and hopefully tell you stuff. I'm sure some of you have heard some of this, but none of you have heard all of it. So, um, so I'm, I'm just going to, well, okay, meeting Grendel's mother in the spiritual swamp. I, I said um, earlier today that, uh, you know, I took, I took my belief system that had been handed handed to me with kid gloves, you know, by my parents and everybody, and I and I put it on the anvil. And you 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 have to appreciate how religious my family was is. Um, so my dad was a minister, my mom's dad was a minister, my dad's brother was a missionary in Bonaire. Um, my mom's brother worked at a Christian radio station. My mom's other brother was some kind of an elder in his Baptist church. Um, and, and like, you know, they took us to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, um, Christian school, like, all, I mean, man, I'm like the most indoctrinated person ever, okay? And not, not only that, um, the church where my dad was a minister, he wasn't the minister, he was a minister. It was a miniature mega church. I mean, it was as close as you can get in Lincoln, Nebraska. It was, at its peak, it was about 3,000 people. And, and this was a very hardcore intellectual kind of church, like doctrine, Greek, Hebrew, to give you an idea. Um, when, when our pastor did the book of Romans, which is the most theologically complex book in the New Testament. Um, the first sermon lasted 55 minutes, and I think that he got to verse 2. Okay? And, like, you're jumping all over the place. Hyperlinks were invented by theologians in the Middle Ages. Okay? And, like, this word was used here, and this word is so... So I was totally prepared for the Internet before, you know, long before it ever came along. And, um, and so, you know, Greek words and Hebrew and all this kind of stuff. So, man, they, they armed us to the teeth. Um, and, uh, but I was on the inside of a system. And I sort of knew I was on the inside of a system. And sometimes you would hear the circular logic. Like, for example, well, if God wanted to reveal himself he would be able to do a good job of it, and so therefore he would write an infallible book, and so therefore the Bible is infallible. And I always knew there was something, there was something a little off with that. When I was young, I wasn't quite sure what it was, but it was like, you didn't really prove anything by saying that. You kind of made an assertion and then duct taped it together with another assertion, and this thing is really just kind of assertions here. Right, so I kind of knew that, but I wasn't quite sure how to get to the bottom of the swamp, and and I didn't necessarily have to anyway. Um, but 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 that that kind of gives you an idea. Oh yeah, and then well, I married Laura. Laura's brother was a missionary in Brazil for a while, and now he runs an organization called Children's Relief International, which ministers to the poorest kids in the poorest countries, and they got projects in Mozambique and Uganda. They, um, like the, the, the very, there's, a, there's some kind of refugee camp in Somalia that they're, no, Sudan, not Somalia, uh, that they're working on, India. Um, and so, like, yeah, I got, got it from all sides. Well, okay, so it was, um, I remember it was the, it was right after New Year's on 2003, and at this point in my life, I've been out of the Dilbert Cube for like a year and a quarter. Um, it's working. Um, I'm fairly convinced of the value of spreading Christianity because I know, like, I know what my brother-in-law does, right? And I, you know, I know that they, they go to these villages and stuff and they get clean water and all this other stuff. And, um, and, and I, also, I also know that, like, 
If, if, if you take a bunch of kids in Mozambique and you put them in vacation Bible school, they'll learn how to read. They'll learn about Jesus instead of worshiping evil spirits and all this. So I, I thought it was pretty valuable. And so, so it, was, um, it was right after the new year, and I was at my friend's house, and we were talking about stuff. And he's like, hey, you know, like, what are your New Year's resolutions? And one of them, I wrote down, um, it, I, it wasn't the wording that I would have preferred, but, but it, was, it was clear enough. It was, I wrote down mail order evangelism. And what it meant was, okay, Perry, so you learned how to, you've learned how to be a marketer, and you're a fairly decent marketer now. Maybe you should apply your marketing chops to spreading your faith. And, um, and, and so I wrote that down. And a few months I, I had this idea that it would be like, I don't know, postcards or something. But um, a few months later, what I ended up doing was making an autoresponder series and a Google ad account. And I wrote this. I always, OK, so let me back up a step, because there's a whole piece of this that is necessary to make this make sense. OK, so I've, um, in, in my evolution project, I talk about demilitarized zones. I love demilitarized zones. And a demilitarized zone is a place where, well, it's several things. So the rules of a demilitarized zone is, is you have to be mannerly. You can't hide behind a screen name. You assume positive intention on the part of the other person who disagrees with you, okay, and get to the truth, not the sale. Those are the four rules. Like, that's the evolution 2.0 DMZ, okay? And, well, so when we moved to Chicago, um, I had heard before, when I was still living in Nebraska, I had heard both wonderful and horrible, scathing things about Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois, which is like, I don't know, 15 miles north of here. And um, my friends told me it was this super innovative jeans kind of church, and they totally reinvented it. And then I heard from my mom, um, Perry. I heard about a church in Chicago that took a marketing survey and got rid of all the things people don't like about church, and then they started a church. <gasps> okay, and, and, and what that meant was they took, they took away all the hellfire and brimstone and all the really good stuff, and they just turned it into a, a big wedding cake or something. Okay, that's what that meant coming from my mom, okay? And I thought... I thought, well, they're doing something. So we got to Chicago and like, well, let's go check it out. And so show up on a Saturday night and I walk in the place. It's like this big giant theater. It's not like a church. It doesn't have the, it has a little bit like the vibe. It doesn't look like a church. It doesn't, it doesn't have the entrap, trappings of a church and they, they're playing jazz music on stage, and then like, like at precisely 7 o'clock on the second, the curtain opens up, and there's singers, and there's drama, you know, and then this guy in jeans, which was not very common at the time, like gives this talk about how, you know, you don't chase people down the street if they don't want to hear about your faith, you find the ones that are hungry. And, you know, and I knew enough about sales and marketing. I knew that was a good idea, you know, and, and, and the whole, and I, and when it was all done, I thought they fixed it. They fixed church. Oh my word. Like I had always had this inexpressible frustration because where I grew up, it was like, if there was somebody on the outside and you wanted to get them on the inside, it was like starting a car in fourth gear. You would probably burn out a clutch or two just like trying to get them past all the weird cultural elements and why do we sing these weird songs and what do all these phrases mean and 
You know, what if they don't know Greek and Hebrew, you know, and all this stuff? And Willow Creek, they had completely axis shifted church, okay? They had really rethought the whole thing. It was a bunch of really young people at the beginning, and they just, like, they just completely shattered the box. And Willow Creek became world famous for doing this. And I went there, and, and it got to the end of the service, and I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I got to do something here. Well, so... The interesting thing that I ended up doing was actually a DMZ. So I got this friend named Gary Poole. Um, he, he used to work there. He was one of the leading lights. And he had created this thing called a seeker small group. And a seeker small group was basically a Bible study for non-Christians. You did not get to assume anything. And you never knew what was going to show up. Okay, and what they were going to think, but like you can't, you, you there's no luxury of assuming that everybody agrees or anything. All you know is they're curious and they probably got some issues and they probably got some angst and they did, right? And all these people show up, and so now I've got this like mosh pit. It'd be like it'd be like this table right here, right? And I'm the leader, and there's all these people, you know, and 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 this guy's a Buddhist. And this lady is an ex-burned-out Catholic. And this guy used to be a Lutheran and lost his way a long time ago, but then he got married and had kids, and now he's like, oh, well, I can't teach my kids nothing. And, like, he comes scurrying back to church because it has this, it, it feels like a safe place to raise kids, right? And, you know, and then th this guy's an atheist, right? And this guy doesn't know what he believes, and they all filled in some card that said, um, hey, um, I might like to get in one of these seeker small groups where you explore stuff. And I loved it. It was great. Um, and like one, one time Laura came, one time we're in this group and we're having this super intense conversation. Everybody's got angst, everybody's got issues and I'm either, you know, some of them are sort of throwing knives at me and and, and, and Laura just disappears. And, um, and later I'm like, where did you go? Like, I kind of felt like I needed you. She goes, I couldn't stand it. It was just like too much pressure. I had to leave. Uh, and um, one time I had a, a friend, the guy that trained me to do this, I had him sub for me. And because um, I was out of town and I called him and he goes, Perry. He goes, I went from home, home from your group, and my shirt was soaked with sweat, and I had to take a nap. Those people were so intense. Like, oh, they're hungry, but man, they're wrestling with stuff, and I loved it. And what would happen is these people would become Christians, and they would become uninteresting to me. It's like, like this angst would go away. I'm like, well, you're no fun anymore. Um, and I'm kind of being facetious, but not really. Like, I actually liked them in the angsty stage. After, after uh, they got that sorted out, like, well, I don't know. I'm sure there's a class or something that you could go to, but I think I've helped you as much as I can. And I just loved that, like, that DMZ mosh pit thing. And I loved having the knives thrown at me. And they'd throw everything you can imagine, so I thought. It wasn't really. Like, I didn't, realize, I didn't realize that I was getting the kid's glove version, okay, because they were actually, they had come through several filters before they ever got to me. Well, um, later, so I loved, I loved that. Later, um, I took my seeker small group out of the church, and I put it in Borders Bookstore in Oak Park. And basically, the reason I did that was because of lead generation. At Willow, at the church, which was 30 miles away from my house, I had no control over how many people filled out a little card and got sent over to me or anything like that. And I just didn't have enough people. And so I thought, well, why don't I just take matters into my own hands? And so, like, I would send little press releases to the local newspapers, and I would post stuff on bulletin boards. And, like, so we have the spiritual discussion group at Borders Bookstore at, you know, 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And, 
and these people would show up. Well, they were, they were unfiltered, okay? Okay, so they were less interested and they had way more angst and they had way more issues and they had way harder questions. And so, that, so it was like, well, you know, it was like in some kind of tournament, you know, going from, I don't know, the junior varsity to, you know, something kind of serious, right? And so now I'm doing that. But then I kind of get acclimated to that and I get used to those kind of questions. And, and, and of course, I, I guess I like having knives thrown at me. So, um, so, so that went well. And, um, well, so, so, so this is the background. All of this has happened before, um, before I, you know, mail order evangelism on my, on my New Year's thing. And, and, and so, um, so I, I put up this website, I put up, and, and I'll, I'll show it to you. So this is, this is what um, archive.org says my website looked like. Um, you know, your classic squeeze page, right? The unvarnished truth about religion, Christianity, and spirituality in 2004. We have an auto-date script on that thing, so now it says 2019. It's barely changed. Um, it, the, the background's different, but it's like the same thing, and, and, and it's deliberately written to be more interesting to the person who has angst and skepticism than it is to people who are like, you know, going with the program, right? And so, and so I put this up, and I started driving Google traffic to it, and um, and for you know typically three three to five to seven cents a click, I'm getting ten percent of these people to sign up, and they're getting this email thing called Seven Great Lies of Organized Religion. Okay, so I start this, and right about the same time. Brian, Brian moved to China in 2000, okay? And Brian, Brian got a seminary degree. So, so we grew up in the super, super, super conservative church, and Brian stayed super conservative, so he's like the right-wing guy, and I'm drifting to the left, and I'm going to Willow Creek, and Willow Creek is like, oh, man, those guys are full of compromises and... You know, they're pandering, you know, to the world, and they're entertaining people. And Brian and I had all these arguments about all this stuff. Well, Brian spends four years. He gets a, a, a THM, a theology master's degree, basically. And he ends up, instead of becoming a pastor, he moves to China, and he gets a job teaching English as a second language in a hotel in Lijiang. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and his church is kind of helping him do that. And so Brian's a missionary, and I'm doing this. Well, about two years into Brian's, so you got to understand like where Brian went to school. He went to school, okay, I call it the citadel of clenched fist Christianity. That's probably a bit extreme, but like... Like, man, they got the exact answers, okay? And, um, and he received this perfectly coiffed Excel spreadsheet of, like, everything. Like, we got, dude, we got this all figured out. We got, you know, the end times all figured out, and we've got, you know, Noah's Ark all figured out. And, like, you know, we got, it's nailed down, man. And so now he's in China, and for the first time in his life, nobody can tell him what to do. Nobody can tell him what to, to read, he has the internet at, you know, whatever baud rate, but, you know, he's got it, right? So he can go surf, and he's got actually quite a bit of free time, and he can explore, and he starts figuring out, hey, you know that spreadsheet with all the exact answers? Like, these are not quite adding up here. Like, um, the Earth is not... 6,000 years old, like you can, boy, you can figure that out real easy, right? And then there's all these other problems. And there's problems like, for example, so, you know, at Brian's, like where, where Brian's coming from, they believe like, dude, like all you need is 
if, like, if you know about, enough about the Bible, you should be good. And my mom has mental illness, and she knows a lot about the Bible, and this is not working for her. And like, I'm just, I just think this is like, dude, this is a medical condition. Well, he didn't think so, okay? He still kind of thought this was uh, some kind of a moral issue. And so anyway, this whole thing is starting to unravel for him. And who is a safe person that he could talk to about this? There's only one, and it's me. Because I've been in the DMZ mosh pit for several years, and so here come the emails and all of these questions. Well, that's great, but there's a problem. And the problem is, you know, all these people that have been throwing knives at me, they do not have a master's degree in theology. And neither do I. Okay? And man, Brian knows where the bones are buried. Boy, does he know where the bones are buried. And especially once he kind of got this thing going, then he really knows where the bones are buried. And like he's got a massive database. And most of these, most of these arguments and most of these, they are so shallow and they so miss the point and they are so not at the bottom of the swamp, it's not even funny. Most they don't have any uh, well, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Like they think that's like a smart question. <laughs> oh my goodness, right? Brian, well, Brian is not asking those questions, okay? Brian's asking hard ones, right? So, um, like, like where, we, where we grew up, like, we thought the Bible was inerrant. And, well, what does that mean? And what does inspired mean? And, like, how much can you defend that? And so, so th these conversations start going, and I don't, like, I don't know how to answer a lot of these questions. And, um, and so, you know, we're, 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 flo we're in the swamp somewhere, but we're certainly not at the bottom. And, like, and he's just, you know, he's taking shots. And I, and I kind of have this growing list of questions. And one thing I just need to mention is, is, uh, you know, whatever sort of faith you have, I'll tell you this, um, a person can ask you a lot more questions than any human, reasonable human being could ever expect you to answer really fast, okay? And that doesn't mean there aren't answers, but it might mean that you don't have a PhD, okay? And so I'm, I'm, I'm getting hammered with this stuff. Well, at some point, Brian becomes not really wanting to keep stressing our relationship over this and even not really wanting to argue about this stuff anymore, but now he's loaded me with all of these questions myself. And like, and I'm, I'm kind of staggering under the weight of it, but now Brian, so, so I, like I wanted, I wanted Brian to, to be the anvil, and he's like, I don't want to be an anvil anymore. You're going to have to go get that somewhere else. So where do I get it? On the internet, where there's an infinite supply of sparring partners. And, and, and I can buy them for five cents a click all day long. And I'm making quite a bit of money as this, you know, budding internet marketing consultant. And, you know, spending three to 5,000 bucks a month on traffic is not really a problem. It's just kind of a nice tax write-off. Okay, so I'm spending 50 or 60,000 bucks a year getting sparring partners on my autoresponder series, and every reply to every email goes to me. And, and, and I, I knew, I was very conscious. I was taking all that stuff, and I was putting it on an anvil in public, I'm, you know, buying, you know, I mean, you guys all know how traffic works. Most of you do anyway, like Google Display Network, you know, anybody I can entice with one of these little ads, here they come, right? And, I'm, and the, my copy's written to provoke the angry ones, so here we go. And so can anybody destroy this? And I'm not so sure they can't. How would I know, right? 
I mean, there's all these people saying, you know, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it kind of stuff. Like, if I, you know, what about, like, all the professors at Yale Seminary or whatever, you know, whoever. Well, so this email list got to 75,000 people. Um, and, uh, man, every, opening that email box every time, it was like opening a hornet's nest. And, um, and this is like, this is a really good way to 80 20 the whole thing. It's like, well, what, you know, which hill are you willing to die on, right? Well, so then um, in the middle of all this, I go visit Brian in China in 2004. And when I get there, I figure out, ooh, he's bailed on this thing. I didn't realize that. Like, I don't know. I thought he was still trying to sort it out. I get to China, it's like, he's done. He, it's out the window, which is very shocking to me. It's like, wow, uh, OK, how does this work? I mean, that's a pretty major shift in your family dynamic, right? Like, the most devout, most conservative, went to seminary brother has bailed. OK, so that was kind of disturbing. And so we're riding on this little bus. And we get into an argument again, like yet another one. And um, Bullock said he showed this personality test in it, uh, yesterday on the screen. And it said something about, it was like, well, when you're stressed, your personality goes into these areas. OK? And it, it triggered something, because when, I was when I'm stressed, I, I become an engineer. <laughs> OK? And I was stressed. Yeah, Kyler's like, oh, yeah, I guess dad's right about that. OK, yeah. Well, so I went into, into engineering mode. And I go, Brian, look at the hand at the end of your arm. I said, this is a nice, nice piece of engineering. And I've done engineering for a long time. You don't think this is an accumulation of random accidents, do you? Hold on. And he just comes right back at me, and he's got your basic, standard, neo-Darwinian, random mutation, natural selection, don't need no designer, just need millions of years of all this stuff. And I listened to that, and I was like, OK. I'm, I'm thinking 10 chess moves ahead. I thought, maybe he's right. Now, I've never heard of this in engineering school. Like, I've never seen any engineering optimization program that worked the way that what he just described. But I also know that most biologists would agree with him, not me. And they can't all be that stupid. And there could definitely be stuff I don't know. And so I just, I just decided right then, I am going to stop arguing with Brian right now. And I'm going to go home, and I'm going to let science decide this for me. And I just like took all my eggs, and I put them in the science basket. And he, now, why did I do this? It's because theology is squishy, and electrical engineering isn't. That's why. And, and now, um, this is actually a good, a good opportunity to make a little point about here. So. We've got this whole problem, transformation, synthesis. How do you get to the bottom of the swamp? How do you get to the real question? Let me actually kind of real quickly walk you through how I did this thinking process. OK. So the, the, the perceived problem, the deadlock, is creation or evolution. That's the way the problem is normally presented. Well, I said, the problem is not the real problem. Actually, I'd already figured this part out a year or two before. And my, my reframe was, no, it's not creation or evolution. It's naturalism or design. It's materialism or design. Is, is biology purposeful or is biology purposeless? Which is it? Now, every, all my engineering instincts told me that my hand was purposeful. But the biologist's 
Mostly we're saying it was purposeless. Now, that's a reframe. Well, so I said, I have a new dilemma. I have a new question, and here's, here's how I'm going to frame the dilemma. When I went to engineering school, making millions of copies of something, randomly mutating some of them, and letting natural selection sort them out was never mentioned in engineering school in any class as a way of optimizing things. And we studied a lot of ways of optimizing systems. OK? So why haven't I heard of that in engineering? Do, we, do engineers know something biologists don't? Or do the biologists know something the engineers don't? I am going to go home from China, and I am going to find out. And I am going to get to the bottom of the swamp. Now, I had a reference for this of, of knowing in my gut what, when I found what I was looking for, I knew what it would feel like. And let me tell you what that was. Um, when I was a senior in college, I wrote an acoustics paper, and I had to figure out this I, I was fascinated with speakers, and there was this kind of a speaker called the transmission line, and I wasn't really content with the way that people had worked out the math of that kind of a speaker. And so, hey, I got a professor. I'm in an acoustics class. I got to write a term paper. Let's figure this out. And I tried to figure out before, and I would get lost, not on the bottom of the swamp, not touching the bottom of the swimming pool, don't know where to start, don't know where... Don't work, we're the beginning, middle, of end of this. Finally, in this class, I figured it out. And I had to literally start with Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration, which is like the most basic thing in physics that you could possibly imagine. I had to start with the most basic thing, and then I worked it all out, and I figured it out, and I turned it in, and I got an A in my paper, and suddenly I knew what it feels like to be at the bottom of a swamp. F equals MA is the bottom of the swamp in physics. And I can start with that, and I can de derive the wave equation. I can do all this stuff. It's hard. It doesn't come very naturally, but I could figure it out. And I figured it out. And I knew what that felt like. And I said, if, if a hand can evolve by accidental copying errors, something in engineering will tell me exactly how that works. So here we go. And I, I leapt into the void. It was like, you know what? I'm going to hang this stuff on that, because that is exact. And it was terrifying, because I didn't know. It was like leaping into a, a chasm. You got, you got to remember, like, so Brian, you know, Brian, Brian tosses this whole thing out the window. He suddenly realized he's got a bunch of new dilemmas in his life. For example, well, what kind of girl is he going to bring home to mom? OK? If he brings home a Christian girl, he's got a problem. If he brings home a non-Christian girl, he's got a problem. Oh, this is not good, right? But I'm not going to stay a Christian just because of family pressure. I can't do that. I'm way too honest. Like, I can't just, like, you know, go into denial or something. I'm not going to believe this stuff if it's not true. Um... And so I don't know what I'm going to find out. Maybe Brian and I are going to be smirking at each other during Thanksgiving dinner and like, yeah, they're all praying to their invisible sky daddy and we know there is no, and, you know, and all that, right? That could, that could happen. And, you know, I've got, I've got little kids at home and I've got a wife and, like, we go to church and we've got friends and, like, you know, if I bail on this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wreak havoc with all of that. Well, I don't care. Like, I don't like it, but... Like, here we go. I'm just, like, going to do this. So, so I go down the rabbit hole, and I was completely lost for a few weeks, and I was just uh, really, and, and, oh, obsessive. So you're all, you're entrepreneurs, so you're all obsessive. So you know, like, okay, like, when, when man, like, when your inner pit bull chomps down on something, and, you know, and so I'm ordering books from Amazon, and I'm surfing websites, and I'm, listening to programs and watching videos and, and, and I'm just tearing through it and I'm reading the creationist literature and the Darwinist literature and I'm 
buying books from both sides, and I am just lost, totally lost. Okay, so you real so we're here, right? And suddenly one day I'm reading about DNA and the genetic code, and I'm like, ooh, I've seen this before. I know exactly what this is. I, I know how to deal with this. This is digital code. This is ones and zeros. Now, in biology, they're A, C, G, T, but, but it's like, it's a quaternary code. It's like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. This is digital code. This is transmission and reception of digital code. I wrote an Ethernet book in 2002 because my marketing gurus told me, like, if you're the guy that writes the book, an industrial Ethernet was really hot in that market. So I, like, gutted it up and figured it out and wrote an Ethernet book. And so I knew how the ones and zeros go acro across the wire. I'm like, OK, so that means this almost certainly has error correction. This almost certainly has redundancy. Like I knew the things like to get an ethernet packet from the router to your cell phone, like there's all these things that have to happen to protect the data because digital data is extremely fragile. It's like one error in a million fragile. You have one error in a million and you have a corrupted file. It's incredibly fragile. I'm like, okay, so that's the game we're in. This is, infer this is communication theory. I know about this. Th evolution is a software engineering problem. New question. Okay, now we're at the transformation part. Okay? So I do a few months of research, and I figure out, a couple of things. I figure out number one. There's a million codes, 999,999 of them are designed, and there aren't any that aren't designed that we know of. And there's one, we don't know where it came from, it's DNA. Well, that would certainly seem to suggest that my original intuition about the hand at the end of my arm wasn't too far off. And the second thing I figured out was, so, you know, these, this email, even just this email box here, which was Seven Great Lives of Organized Religion, it would get drug into these evolution kind of questions, and I, I kind of figured out I'm not so sure evolution is a bad idea. I'm not so sure evolution is contrary to Christianity. There's lots of ways that you could slice this. I don't think being anti-evolution is necessarily a good idea. And maybe there's a mechanism by which things can self-evolve. I'm not sure. But now, I was like, it has to obey the laws of communication theory if it's true. So, with that under my belt, now we're at Willow Creek again. And my friend Andy, I didn't even go there anymore at this time, because it was too far away, but they had this monthly meeting that they would have, and it was called Truth Quest. And it was like all the hard questions. And, and, and the nice thing about a city like the size of Chicago is there wasn't hardly any other group in Chicago that was like into that kind of stuff. And Willow Creek had it, so there you go. Truth Quest Coffee House, 7.30, Friday night, once a month. They, they always had a great topic. So I would go, and my friend Andy um, ran it. And Andy, Andy know, he's been hearing about all this stuff. He goes, you should come give a talk about your DNA stuff. And I came and I gave a talk in 2005 called if you can read this, I can prove God exists, which is kind of tongue-in-cheek, because I'm not really saying that you can prove God exists, but I, what I'm really saying is, well, you can infer that there's some kind of designer, because nobody knows a way to get a code without designing one. So, um, so I, I give this talk. Well, um, 
they, I, get, I get the recording of it, and I convert it to MP3, and I put it on my website. Well, I put it on a new website, actually, um, which was this one, because now I had a new set of ideas, and I needed an anvil and people to come with sledgehammers. And this was my preferred way to find out what's true. I'm going to take something I think is right, I'm going to put it on the anvil, and then I'm going to invite people to smash it. And if they can smash it, well, I guess that's not true anymore. And this was like my live, working without a net, truth experiment. And so um, I mixed together some astronomy. Like, I think the Big Bang is totally compatible with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Totally. Totally. I don't know if the original author was trying to say that or not, but it's at least compatible, for sure. And not only that, the Big Bang. Okay, so y'all have a spray bottle under your kitchen cabinet. It's got a little nozzle, and you twist it one way, and it makes a mist, and you twist it the other way, and it kind of piddles out, and then, you know, and then you get it like just right in the middle, and it'll squirt in a nice pattern. Okay, so the expansion of the Big Bang is just like that. If it expanded too fast, it would just spray matter out in the universe, and it would never even collect into stars or anything. And if it was a little too slow, you'd get a big crunch. It would go out, and then it would just come back and go, and, and go, okay? And you know... Do you know how fine the difference is between too much and too little? 120 decibel places of precision. Uh, like 0. .000 with 120 zeros, one. This is well known in cosmology. Okay, if that number was off just a little bit, no universe, no stars, no nothing. The expansion rate of the Big Bang, okay? I think it's called the cosmological constant. Don't quote me on that. I'm not a physicist. But I, I know I'm right about, generally right about this. And furthermore, the mass of a proton, the mass of a neutron, the charge of an electron, the charge of a proton, like there's this whole long list of things. And if any one of them was off a little bit, no universe, no life, okay? So I wrote an email series about this, and at the end, I put in my little talk. If you can read this, I can prove God exists. And now people are replying back to it. Now, one of the things I figured out in the middle of this project, so, all right, going, so remember the Borders bookstore thing, and I got all these people? So this was, like, late 90s in Borders Bookstore, in the late 90s, an atheist was a thoughtful, stroke your beard, um, you know, uh, quote uh, Bertrand Russell, you know, sort of a guy, okay? And you'd have these intellectual conversations about such things. But something happened in 2001, and it was 9-11. And the, this triggered a outrage and a reinvention of the atheist community. And they were like, religion flies airplanes into buildings. We must stamp it out. And the, what is now known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens came out like flaming, like attacking religion like crazy, and they created this movement called the New Atheists. And the New Atheists were not these beard-stroking, thoughtful, Bertrand Russell kind of guys. They were like Richard Dawkins, and, and they were mad, okay? Now, so... I got my little coffee house theology website here, and I'm getting emails from Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and, and Urantia guys and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Jews and 
you know, agnostics and every kind of a religion that you can imagine, and I'm having these dialogues with people, and they tend to be fairly reasonably respectful, but the atheists were off the charts. They were just like, you could see them coming a mile away. I could read like one sentence, like, here comes another one. And they were mad. I mean, they were furious. It was like their happy plug fell out. <laughs> Okay, and they're just coming at me with a cudgel, right? Okay, so here comes one of these guys, and he goes, I see through your sophistry and pseudoscience, and, and we go back and forth, and I back him into a corner, and he's getting flustered. And um, so you can see this has gone way beyond Brian now at this point, like, you know, um, Brian's just kind of like watching this from a long distance away. Um, I'm not even sure he's interested in it at this point. But I'm like, now I'm, so here's what happens. He goes to the largest discussion, atheist discussion board on what at the time was the largest atheist website in the world called Infidels. And he posts a link to my talk at Willow Creek. And he says, be nice to this Perry Marshall guy while you rip him to shreds. I've been exchanging emails with him. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. And then this other voice in my head is like, Perry, you've been fixing for this for like a long time. Oh, no. But I don't. I go out to breakfast with John Fancher, and I'm like, John, I really really don't want to do this. He goes, well, looks like you're doing it. I think, I think there's no way out now, and I think God's got a sense of humor, Perry. I mean, I remember I was eating an egg sandwich when he told me that, and I'm like, oh, oh, no. Man, like if I make one little mistake, they will eviscerate me, right? And at this point in time, you know, this is 2005. Um, my internet career is just like taken off like a rocket, and everybody loves Perry, and I like it, and it's affirming, and it's reassuring. And now I have this like this rumbling of orcs, and they're just coming to take my head off. I'm like, oh no. All right, dude, like, you better suit up. All right, so um, one morning I'm, I'm reading my Bible and I'm reading Jeremiah and, and the Holy Spirit highlighter, like, you know, attacks me on the face, okay? And it's th this verse, this is the first chapter of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is this prophet. And, um, and he, like, he gets this commissioning, and it says, get up, get dressed, go out and tell them everything I tell you say, and do not be afraid of them, or I will make you look like a fool. For see, today I've made you immune to their attacks. You are strong, like an iron pillar or a brass wall, a fortified city that cannot be taken. None of the king's priests or officials or people of Judah will be able to stand against you. I am with you. I will take care of you. I, the Lord, will sp have spoken. And I read this, and it just leaps off the page. I'm like, okay. Obviously, I memorized it. Um, it's like, okay. Now, I, I did not like, I really did not like this. Like, all right. Well, I think I have this figured out, but actually, I don't have this entirely figured out. And there might be holes in my theory, and I might not have defined it well enough. I got to stay ahead of them. And I've got a business to run, and I can't just obsess about this all the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to carefully, meticulously craft every single response. I'm going to be as stoic as humanly possible. I'm going to be unemotional, and, and, um, and I am going to do this once a week. And once a week, I'm going to log into their forum. I'm going to read all this stuff, people throwing cudgels at me. And I'm going to calmly respond to all this stuff. And then I'm going to shut it and not look at it for a week. Not even going to touch it. Because my obsessive personality will just like have a nervous breakdown if I do. So here we go. And, and it would take me two or three hours 
to compose all my responses and read all the stuff, and, and my, my shoulders would just be like, 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 like barbed wire by the time it was done. It was like, okay, here we go. And, well, they couldn't poke a hole in any of it. Like, they didn't make an inch of progress. And a month went by, and two months went by, and three months went by, and, like, they got nothing. And this became the longest-running, most-viewed thread on the world's largest atheist forum and the world's largest atheist website, and it went for seven years. And at first it was like every week, and then it's every two weeks, and then it's every month, and then it's every, by the, by the time it got to the end, it was probably once every three or four months, I'd go in there and say, well, has anybody thought of anything new to say, or are they just going to be mad as hornets and not like coming up with anything? And so, um, and, and every time I'd come back in and post something, it would go all the way back up to the top of the forum list, right? You know, it's like 116,000 views and, you know, 1,200 comments and, you know, and, and they, could, you know, they just couldn't solve it. I'd say, show me a code that's not designed. All you need is one. Show me a code that's not designed. All you need is one. Um, and they, they couldn't solve it. Um, well, so, that, so, that's the anvil right there, right? Okay, so in a discussion board, somewhat below the radar of the world, but, you know, in Grand Central Station of the atheist community, I have taken my argument and I have let them pound on this thing as hard as they can, and man, they were motivated. They were angry, right? Well... The problem that we had, and by subtract, what did I eliminate? I am not arguing about evolution. Fine if you want to believe in evolution. I don't see any problem with that. The problem, the question, is, is there some kind of a plan going on or not? That's the question. You know, all, every code I've ever seen requires a plan. So I think we live in a planned universe, not an accidental one. All, everything I know from electrical engineering says that. So that's what I subtracted. Well, so, now, the slingshot, Goliath is no worse than a bear. Look, if they can't figure it out after seven years, neither is anybody else, right? Which is why... I'm speaking at universities like Arizona State University and Penn State and Notre Dame because I do have a solid model, okay? Um, they, thank you to the atheist in all sincerity for helping me figure this out, right? Like, well, my, my, the Evolution 2.0 says to the agnostics and atheists who helped refine the material in this book, to you, I am eternally grateful. <laughs> um, okay, now, we had a problem, though. And here was the problem, is this needed to be simplified. And the, the problem was the arguments would go round and round and round and round in circles, because the argument was just a little bit too complicated for most people to totally wrap their heads around, and they didn't really want to understand it anyway, so it would just go around in circles. And I, and I, I knew every move, and I, but, but every time a new person would come along, it was like you have to re-educate them. And I got tired of this, and I had this blog even after the, after the infidels thing was done. So. Um, one day, here comes another person, and here it goes around in circles again, and this idea came to me. Perry, tell him exactly how to prove you wrong. Exactly. Write a specification and say, if you got a code without designing one, here's how you prove that you did it. And I wrote a specification, stole most of it out of an engineering textbook. 
and I put it there, and I said, okay, here's a spec. Here's how you show, like, if you poured bathtub, chemicals in your bathtub and you got digital communication to happen, here's how you prove you did it. Here's the requirements. Solve this. I'll write you a check for $10,000. And I press submit. Well, what's going to happen? I have no idea what's going to happen next. You know what happened? Silence. Just stopped. And then here comes another person a little later. Silence. They just shut up. Wow, I've never seen this happen. These guys never showed up. Now, let me say something. I'm sure there's atheists in the room. And if you're here, you're probably not some foaming, mad, spitting nails, like whatever these guys were. And so, like, I don't have something against atheists. I'm just telling the story of this is how it went. Okay, and, um, and, 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 but it's like, wow, well, I think, I think I figured something out. Well, you know what I did was I proposition simplified the question. Solve the problem, get a check. And any Homer Simpson can understand that. They may not understand digital communication theory. They might not understand information entropy. They might not understand... Ethernet or anything else, I mean, I, these are admittedly kind of esoteric topics, but, well, did somebody come up with a code without designing one and win the money? Yes or no? Nope. No. Okay, well, there you go. Shut it down. Well, so, I started working on the Evolution 2.0 book, and one of my friends said, Perry, and this was definitely a memo from the head office, and he told me, he goes, Perry, this needs to be a $10 million prize, not a $10,000 prize. I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? Where am I going to get $10 million? And I was having dinner with this guy one night. He goes, well, that's easy, the patent. And I'm like, the patent? He goes, yeah. He goes, he goes, have a small amount of money if they can solve it, and have a big amount of money to buy the patent from them and pay for the patent. And I'm like, I'm still not quite getting it. He goes, look, if somebody can pour chemicals in a bathtub and by some process get them to turn into digital code, you just created AI. Like some big company would pay a lot of money for that. And all of a sudden, oh. Now, this, this also puts a whole different spin on the whole thing. It's like, well, maybe you want somebody to solve this. It'd be like, it could be worth a billion dollars. Who knows? Like, if, I mean, if, if probably you'd think Microsoft would be all over this thing, right? Oh. Okay, that's a pretty good idea. And you know what it does? It completely changes this thing from can you prove Perry wrong to, you know, Perry doesn't really care. We just have an unanswered question. And that's actually where I clicked into synchronization with what science is. I don't think anybody wants to be in the business of predicting what science will not figure out tomorrow. Who knows? Truth is stranger than fiction. Like, isn't that, isn't that a you know, subtitle of this seminar? Right? Who knows? Well, so... I'm going to skip some parts of the evolution story because I don't want to spend all night talking about that. But the, the long story short is that, so the evolution 2.0 book came out. And we started with a $3 million prize because that's how many, I could get three investors to say, okay, yes, if this is discovered, I will write you a million dollar check. And then we raised it to $5 million. And in the very, very, very near future, I'm about to raise it to 10. There's like, there's a whole 
well, there's a whole set of things that's about to happen that's incredibly exciting that I just can't talk to you about yet. But like, give it a month and it'll be public information. But last week, well, let's just put it this way. Um, and I'd appreciate if you not just go spreading this around, you know, just kind of keep this in the room, but, um, but a, an opportunity showed up that we could publicize this thing. And I had $9 million in ba of backing in place. And I went, so I got a mastermind group where I go get my teeth kicked in, right? Because everybody needs a place to go get your teeth kicked in. I, if you don't, I think you're stupid. Um, and, um, and I go, well, I, I've got this opportunity here. And if I can get $1 million more million committed from investors, then I can double the prize amount to $10 million. And my mastermind group spontaneously goes, so how many of you guys want to like form a corporation and go in together and eight people raise their hands like, okay, we've got eight people, $125,000 a piece. Robert, you formed the LLC. There you go, Perry. Got you covered. And then, yeah, this is last Thursday. Okay, then an hour later, somebody calls me because I've been sending texts and it's like, it's like, what are these texts? What's going on here? I give him a one-minute explanation. He goes, I'm in. Then I got number 11, which is a backup slot. And then the next day, I have another, because I had been scrambling, like raising money. OK, here's something about raising money. There's no easy way to do it. You go to rich people, and you ask them for money. It's just that simple. It's just like Amway, only better. <laughs> And you get a lot of no's and occasionally get a yes, and there's no, there's no getting around it. There's no, I mean, maybe someday there will be, but there sure is as far as I know, right? And it's mostly personal relationships. Almost all of these people have been clients, actually. Um, it's like, well, this is kind of crazy, but I don't know. I guess I trust you, you know? <laughs> so because some of them really do get it. Um, maybe they all do, but anyway. Um, and then, and then on Friday, I go, well, you know, when I emailed you the other day, like I had positions open, and now I don't have any more positions open, but we could put you on the waiting list. And they're like, okay, we're on the waiting list. Put us, put us down. Okay, so, you know, so now I got, I guess, $12 million. Another, um, an, uh, another very significant event was... Um, I went to this evolution conference at the Royal Society in Great Britain in the fall of 2016. And, um, and, and I have to make this really quick. Most of the evolution 2.0 isn't even about what I just told you. It's really about how evolution actually works, OK? And like nobody's telling you the, the straight story, OK? The creationists tell you that it's a hoax. And the, the, the popular media tells you it's a big accident. It's neither, OK? So do the electrical, do the engineers know something biologists know? Do the biologists know something the engineers don't know? Neither. The cells know something nobody knows, which is how to rearrange their own code, re-engineer their own DNA in, in response to hundreds of inputs from the environment and change their genetics on the fly. That's why evolution happens. It's the most remarkable engineering you've ever even imagined. OK? In my opinion, if, like, if people of faith, and I don't care what kind of faith it is, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, whatever, if people of faith understood evolution, they would be shouting it from the rooftops, and the, and, and the not people of faith would be changing the subject. It is so unbelievably remarkable. And it happens in real time. And I know people have done these experiments. And that whole view has been marginalized in the scientific community until a guy named Dennis Noble organized a, a conference at the Royal Society. And basically, Dennis is the most credible renegade in the evolution space to, to decide to take this on. And he has too much credibility for anybody to take him out. He's the guy. He's the... 
He's the first person to model a human organ on a computer, which was done in 1960 on punch cards on borrowed time on a university computer. When he ran his punch cards, he figured out the cardiac rhythm which made pacemakers possible. He has a Commander of the British Empire medal from Queen Elizabeth. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, and he said, people aren't telling the real story about evolution. We need to have a conference, and, he, and the Royal Society is the oldest scientific organization in the world arguably the most prestigious, and he had this huge political battle, and he got this thing, and I went there, and I sat there, and it was like Forrest Gump. I'm like, I can't believe I heard all this happen. Like, like the toothpaste is now out of the tube. And I went to Dennis, and I said, Dennis, I got this prize, and can we talk when I get home? And he says, sure, and I talked to him, and he came on board as a judge. Okay, so now I've got an Oxford professor who's a fellow of the Royal Society as a judge on my prize judging panel. Okay, then a few months later, I got a hold of a guy named George Church. George Church is basically the godfather of modern genetics. He's at Harvard and MIT. He has a huge lab. Everybody in genetics knows who he is. I emailed him, he goes, yeah, I'm really interested in this. So he came on board as a judge. So I have the leading geneticist at Harvard and the leading physiologist at Oxford on my judging panel, and I'm an electrical engineer who does marketing consultant for a living. But I have a ruthless quest to get to the bottom of the swamp and to put stuff on the anvil, right? This is the most fundamental question in science that can be precisely defined, that I know of, okay? And I've got a five million, soon to be $10 million prize for this. Right? And so, like, getting these judges, I mean, getting Dennis on board might have been, like, the most important day of my life, right? Because nobody wants to take you seriously until you have some street cred, right? Um, so, that's kind of where that's at, and I'm very excited about it. And, you know, maybe 500 years from now, nobody will have solved it. George Church thinks they'll solve it in five years. Maybe he's right. I don't know. If he does, the world totally changes, because AI doesn't exist right now. If we figure that out, AI will exist, like real AI, not like Siri. Like Siri is as dumb as a box of rocks, and Siri couldn't convince a six-year-old that Siri was a real person for more than 45 seconds, and that would be on a good day, right? Well, that could all change if we figure this out. Now, let me totally switch gears. Let me talk about a number of things. Um, okay, I don't believe in God because I believe, okay, my, my conception of God in this has changed quite a bit, okay? So when I gave that talk at Willow Creek, if you can read this, I can believe God exists. I mean, I was sort of conceptually like, well, you know, okay, okay, indulge me a little bit. Well, there's this bearded man in the sky, and he's got this keyboard. I mean, I was kind of, sort of like, you know, framing it like that. Okay, okay, I don't think of it that way anymore, okay? See, I don't think code is the bottom of the swamp. I think consciousness is the bottom of the swamp, okay? And nobody understands what it is, really. Like, it's like a big, opaque mystery, like, well, I'm having experience inside of my head, and you're having experience inside your head. And if I watch a YouTube video watching white blood cells chase germs around, it kind of looks like they're having an experience too. And it, it sure looks like my dog chasing a rabbit through the backyard. Both of them are having an experience, and that's consciousness. And only consciousness creates codes. I think co consciousness is the question. I think that's the real bottom of the swamp. Okay? So, like... See, I don't think there's any place in nature where you say, okay, see past that dotted line, that's where God is. I don't think nature works that way. God is not in competition with nature. So, you're all entrepreneurs. So, an entrepreneur understands that, okay, I got two restaurants. Restaurant A, fabulous, super, five-star gourmet food, and the chef works in there 14 hours a day. 
Restaurant B, McDonald's. Ray Kroc's dead and they're still flipping burgers 50 years later. Which is more impressive? McDonald's, right? Okay. So which is more impressive? A universe that through its innate fruitfulness and its possibly even conscious desire to develop produces an ecosystem that produces forests and produces zebras without maintenance. Is that more impressive or is it more impressive if, oh, you know, I think we need some zebras, so let's beam some down. Which universe is more impressive? Okay, if, if, if you went to Sunday school and they told you that God beamed down the zebras from the sky, then okay, God bless them, and that's a nice story to tell to children. But when you're an adult, it's like, okay, so, you know, if something can evolve from something lesser into a zebra, that's damn impressive. And there isn't an engineer in the world that knows how to make a circuit or a computer program that does that. Okay, one blade of grass is 10,000 years ahead of any human technology. Okay, so, so, so the posture we should have towards nature is extreme humility. Okay, and let me remind you, we can now edit genes as easily as Microsoft Word, so some humility might be in order. Like, serious humility. You can buy a a gene editing kit for $169 on Amazon, okay? So, like, perilous times. Um, so, let me, let me, so yeah, nothing ha so, so look, I believe that God made a universe that is orderly beyond my current comprehension, but the order is measurable and discoverable. Uh, a little, little um, thing I'd like to mention is there are, there are two things, there are two like triumphs of Western civilization that come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. The first one is science. Okay? It's not a coincidence that China, India, the Mayas and Incas, Rome, and a couple other, the Egyptians, they all had stumbling discoveries of science, and then they petered out and they didn't go anywhere. But in Western Europe, where most of the scientists were very, very devoutly religious people and regarded the practice of science as an act of worship, science flourished and took off like a rocket in the Middle Ages. It is not a, it is not a coincidence that, ha that that happened in a Christian context, okay? The first statement of a scientific worldview that I am aware of is in the book of Wisdom of Solomon, which is in the Catholic Apocrypha. It was written about 200 BC. It says, thou hast ordered all things in weight and number and measure. 2,200 years ago. I am not aware of any equivalent statement older than that from anywhere else. Well, th there's, a, there's a foundation for the scientific method right there. Okay, now the, the, other, the other triumph of Western civilization is equality. Now, we modern people say things like, a truly evolved society would provide affordable health care for all of its citizens, even the ones that are, you know, low income and in bad situations. And now, we might have lots of disagreements about how we achieve that, but everybody agrees that would be great. Right? Right? However, we can do it. Okay, so I want you to notice. So, you know, a truly evolved society would do this. You realize that is like the antithesis of Darwinian evolution. It is the total opposite. 
Okay? So, that means there's two kinds of evolution. I call it evolution alpha and evolution omega. Evolution alpha is the meritocracy, which we all know very well, right? You gotta compete, dude. You gotta have a definitive selling proposition, right? You gotta be a star business. And like, if you're not on top of your games, your competitors are gonna cut your legs out from under you, and we all understand that very well. And if only we were as smart as bacteria, man, then we could really evolve, okay? That's the meritocracy, that's evolution alpha. You know what evolution omega is? Affordable health care for everybody. Uh, evolution omega is, we hold these things to be self-evident that all men are endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's evolution omega. And it's a totally different deal. Where did that come from? Galatians 3.28, in Christ there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, all are equal in Christ Jesus. There is no equivalent statement of that strength anywhere else in the ancient world. That's the first statement of equality in the history of civilization, right there. And that idea got planted in Western civilization in 40 or 50 AD, and it brewed and developed and churned and people argued and people fought. And now here we are in the 21st century and we're like, yeah, everybody's equal. Nobody in the ancient world thought anybody was equal. Man, we go down to the village down the, down the road and we burn it down and we take everything. Because either they eat this winter or we do and there's not enough for both of us. That's the ancient world, right? Okay, well, we got rid of that mentality. Well, sort of, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, hey, you know, look, the Huns are always at the door. I mean, that's true, okay? But so, so I, I think there's, there's some real depth to the Judeo-Christian story. So I want to... Uh, talk about a few other things, okay? Kind of random synapse firings, okay? So there's this popular kind of saying out there, oh, you know, Christianity was invented in 300 AD by Constantine, and, you know, whatever it was before, we're not really sure what it was, but then they institutionalize it. Well, okay. I'll be the first to um, acknowledge that Constantine kind of bureaucratized Christianity in 300 AD. But he did not invent it, and these books definitively settle the issue. Um, so this set of books, I bought these like 15 years ago. Um, they start in 60 AD, and they go to 1,000, and it's writings of the early church fathers. Okay, so... You want to know what people were talking about in 140 AD? Oh, just turn to probably page 35, and like there it is. And you can read some letter that somebody wrote to somebody, right? 65, 80, 90, 100, 110, 125, 140, all of these guys. All right, you can figure out really quick that the basic Christian story has not changed at all since 65 AD. Um, furthermore, it even goes back further than that, and here's why. Um, now see, if somebody says, oh, you know, that was all invented in 300 AD, you know, and all those stories aren't really true, well, you know, then that would make things kind of flimsy. Okay, I, this is a bottom of the swamp thing right here. I think this, what I'm telling you, is a really big deal. It's like this little overlooked detail. And a lot of times, bottom of the swamp things are these little tiny things, but they don't budge. Okay? So, so not, not only can you verify from a book like this that all the stuff they're saying hasn't changed since the end of the first century, okay? 
But then, okay, so when was all this stuff actually written down? Well, the most common thing that you hear was that the Gospels were written between 70 and 90 AD, maybe 100. I'm going to prove to you that that's wrong. Okay? So, in order to explain this, you have to understand that something very, very cataclysmic happened in 70 AD. What was it? The destruction of Jerusalem, okay? The destruction of Jerusalem made 9-11 look like a children's birthday party, okay? And Josephus, in one of his histories, describes it, eyewitness detail, it is absolutely horrific. The Jews and the Romans had been escalating their tension with each other, and uh, in uh, 69 AD, I believe the guy was Vespasian, he said, I've had it. And they surrounded Jerusalem with Roman army, and they starved them out for 18 months, I believe. People were so hungry, they were eating their own children. 500 mercenaries a day were charging out of Jerusalem to go kill Romans, and all 500 of them were being crucified outside of Jerusalem. There were so many crucifixions outside of Jerusalem that the whole entire forested area was denuded from trees being chopped down. And finally, when they basically starved everybody to death, they went in there and they completely demolished it. Completely. I mean, it was done. Okay? Gone. Now, the question would be, did the gospel writers know that this happened when they wrote the gospels? And here, here's an analogy. This is Hiroshima. I want you, so this is Hiroshima in 1945 or 6. I want you to imagine that somebody's writing a history of Hiroshima in 1956. And they're talking about Hiroshima in 1941 and 42 and 43 and 44. Do you think they would mention the atomic bomb? Is there any way they could not mention the atomic bomb if they were writing about Hiroshima in 1956 and talking about... So, let's go to the text and see what it says. And, and, I, and, I, and I have a comparison for you. Okay? How do the authors of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, handle foreshadowing? Well... I'm, uh, th there's another reference point, and it's Judas. Okay? What did Judas do? He betrayed Jesus. Almost every time Judas is mentioned is Judas. Okay, Matthew 10, 14. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him? And it's just talking about stuff they were doing. Mark 3, 19. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him? Luke 6, 16. Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. John 6, 17. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who through one of the twelve was later to betray him. John 12, 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. So what kind of foreshadowing do they give you about the temple in Jerusalem? Matthew mentions this temple 17 times. The only reference to destroying it is Matthew 27, 40. The people were saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. This is the only reference in the book of Matthew to destroying the temple. Mark mentions the temple 12 times with two references to destroying it. Here they are. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days build another, not made my man. He's not even talking about the temple. He's talking about Jesus. Mark 15, 29. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. 
Luke mentions the temple 21 times with one reference to destroying it. Luke 21.5. Some of his disciples were, remarkable, were remar remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And you know what he says next? He doesn't say, and of course we know that happened. He doesn't say that. It's a new chapter. They go on to something else, and they never mention it again. Now, would a person writing about Hiroshima in 1956 never mention the atomic bomb, ever? No, they wouldn't never mention it. Of course they would mention it. Now, um, one of the interesting things that happens if you go to relatives' houses is they'll have books that you would never think to buy yourself. And my father-in-law had this book by Paul Tibbetts, the pilot of the Enola Gay. And the Enola Gay is the airplane that dropped the atomic bomb that we're talking about. He, when you read this book, it's clear that he wrote the book to um, definitively make clear that we had no choice but to use the atomic bomb on the Japanese. He's like, they were not nice, they were not stoppable, they, 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 they were going to take over the whole world, and we had to stop them somehow. And, um, and, and he wrote this when he was like 90 years old, just a couple years before he died, and he was, you know, um, so he wrote it in the 1990s, literally 50 years after he dropped the bomb. Now I have a question for you. Does anybody reasonably doubt that he basically more or less got his facts straight writing about that 50 years later? Do you, do you figure he probably was reasonably close to the truth? Okay, so if something's written in somebody's lifetime, they're not going to like start making up all these miracle stories, okay? It's not going to grow miracles and, and mysticism that fast. Now, one of the questions Brian asked me, and this is a real bottom of the swamp question, I knew it was the minute he asked the question, he goes, so we, we, we lived in this church world that they did not do miracles, they did not do memos from the head office, they did not do prophecy, they didn't do any of this kind of stuff. And, um, and so I was not in a Christian environment that was like, oh, you know, you're sick, let's pray for you and heal you. They, they didn't do that. And Brian says to me, he goes, Perry, learn Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, study the New Testament inside and out. He goes, it doesn't say anywhere that those miracles are going to stop. Now, where I went to church, they said, oh, yeah, all this stuff stopped after, you know, the apostles died. No more miracles. We don't need them anymore. We got, we got our Bible. Brian goes, it doesn't say that anywhere. Like, there ought to be miracles going on. He goes, so where's the miracles? And I'm like. Let me check with my sales manager and get back to you. <laughs> because, like, I'd heard miracle stories, but I hadn't really seen any. And he goes, look, yeah, are people going to tell you these stories? You go chase them down, there's never anything there, dude. And I'm like, Ooh. and, like, I, I immediately knew he was right about the Bible thing. I was like, yeah, it doesn't say that that's supposed to stop. Like, if the Bible's true, this ought to still be going on. So I started looking. Also, my reticular activating system is like wide open. Okay, and I was starting to go to church where they did do this stuff. And then I started chasing stuff down. And Brian turned out to be right for a, lot, a little while. It was like I wasn't finding anything. Like there were several situations. I'm like, okay, so they said like somebody got healed or somebody's leg grew out or something like that. And I would go chase it down and I would find a puff of smoke. And I was starting to get real... I was starting to get real um, antsy about this until I happened to have lunch with my friend Charlie Keck down near Cincinnati, Ohio, and he goes, hey, Perry, my wife's had lupus for years, and it's be been making her miserable, and she went to her Bible study, and somebody stood up in the middle of her Bible study and said, I'm supposed to pray for you right now, and they prayed for her, and her lupus is gone. Like, it's just gone. Really? Okay, and then, like, and then little by little, I started finding other stuff. Okay, so now if you want to go down this rabbit hole, I've got a web page. 
coffeehousetheology.com slash miracles. And what I did was I documented stuff that I have personally had direct experience with. And I wrote about it. You, you, coffee House Theology. Coffee, like drinking coffee. Coffeehousetheology.com slash miracles. And there's this big, long article that you could read the whole article in probably 15 minutes. But you could also, like, click on all the links and watch all the videos and, like, go deep. You could spend five hours. And if you're skeptical, like, you should. I've seen two people who were deaf in one ear. One was a man, one was a woman. One was in North Carolina, one was in Florida. Deaf in one ear for more than 30 years. Both got their hearing back when, when somebody prayed for him. Um, in fact, the guy, it was in Florida in 2008, and... The fact that that happened was documented by a reporter in the Charlotte Observer. Um, and you can read about it. And I talked to him the other day um, because I wanted to double check on it. Uh, the woman, um, she was from Australia, and her name was Deirdre. And she'd had a, so the guy, he um, had been a gunshot too close to his ear, and it made him deaf when he was a kid. And the lady had had a swimming, cold, swimming in cold water thing, and it froze up her ear. And they both got their hearing back. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, hopefully most of you have, like, heard the Vivian story and, like, all this kind of stuff. It's like, I couldn't possibly. So, like, miracles are one of these things, like, okay, we prayed for Uncle Carl and nothing happened. And we prayed for Aunt Betsy and nothing happened. And, you know, and, yep, I know. But a miracle is like a black swan. All you need is one, and they exist. Okay, now if you go looking, there are books and books and books and books of miracle stories. And a few of, a, a small fraction of them are carefully documented. Not nearly enough of them are, but some of them are. Like the Catholic Church has this whole thing about lords. It's this place in France. And they have... They document and document, and they have doctors and x-rays and all kinds of stuff. If you go read my Coffeehouse Theology slash Miracles article, it's got links to all kinds of stuff like that. Man, there is crazy stuff that happens in the world. How many of you know, like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shannon Stewart? She raised her father from the dead. How many years ago? Okay, she could tell you the whole story, I suppose. They gave me a timer. Um, I don't know if I should, like, obey it or not. I guess, you know, if you guys want to have Shannon come up. and, But, but anyway, um, so, like, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on. Um, in 2007, I went to India with Jeremy. How many of you know my customer service guy, Jeremy? Some of you talk to him. He's worked for me for 15 years. We went to India, and Jeremy at that time, probably still is, way more experienced in this sort of thing than me. And um, we, we were at this little Indian church in Rajamundri, India, and they have this church service, and at the end of the church service, Jeremy goes up to the pastor and he goes, hey, tell your people, if anybody wants us to pray for them, like, they could line up right here and I'll pray for them. And the pastor's like, okay. And so these people line up. And Jeremy's like, Perry, help me. I'm like, I've never done this before. Like, okay. So, all right, all right, whatever. Whatever you say, Jeremy, I'll try to help you. So Jeremy starts so praying for these people. So this woman comes and um, she's like, 70 years old, and she can't lift her arms above here. Her shoulders are messed up. And, and, and Jeremy's like, well, well, show us what the problem is. And she goes, okay, so like, I, you know. And I put my fingers on her shoulders, and I could he feel the cartilage grinding in her. It was kind of unsettling, okay? Like, she's got some problems. So Jeremy starts praying for her, 
And about 15 minutes later, she's like, she's like jumping up and down, like, wow, this is, wow, this is amazing. And she's all excited. And it took a while. It didn't happen right away. It's like, it, like Jeremy was just at it and at it and at it. Like, it must have taken like 20 minutes, which is probably, you know, you're like, wow, that's a long time. That woman would have waited in a doctor's office for two hours. Are you kidding? Like 20 minutes is like really fast, right? And then, and then this other woman comes, and she's maybe 30 years old, and she pulls back her hair, and there's this dent in her head. It's like about an inch deep. It's like if you took both of your fingers and just pressed it in, and it like made a dent. And she goes, I had a tumor in my brain, and they removed it, and they took out part of my skull. And so like I'm, you know, under my hair, by my hairline, I'm like missing this part of my skull. So I would like my skull back. <laughs> and ever since the surgery, my hand has had no feeling in it. So... All right, Perry, help me out. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and so Jeremy, he would pray for her, and then he would poke her hand. He'd go, can you feel that? And little by little, like, she starts getting more and more feeling in her hand. And after about 20 minutes, like, she's got all the feeling back in her, hair, in her hand. Now, the head never filled in. She, walked, she still had a dent in her head when she left. But, like, she was all better. And then... A couple months later, I emailed the guy, and but if, you, if, if you've been around this kind of stuff, one of the things you figure out is people regress. Sometimes, they do. It's like, well, she had feeling in her hand when she left church, but it's Tuesday, and it's back to paralyzed again. That happens, or you know, whatever. So I emailed the guy, I'm like, so how are these people? And he's like, dear Perry Marshall, praise glorious name of Jesus Christ. They are all wonderful and they are telling everybody and we cannot wait for you to come back to Rajamundri and heal people again. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I didn't, I think it was Jeremy. I just, I don't, anyway, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. Like, but it happened. Like, it, it was there and it was real. So, um, and, uh, okay, so let's, let's jump to a couple other random topics. Um, okay, Here, here's one. So, um, boy, where I grew up, man, there was some dysfunctional belief. <clears throat> I remember I had this youth pastor <coughs> who... Uh, he believed that his he believed that his miscarried two babies you know he had like two daughters that had made it and they were healthy and but he, early in their marriage they had two miscarriages and he believed that his miscarried babies were in hell like burning in hell because, well, and he had this whole rationale for, like, well, you know, <coughs> they never heard the gospel. Well, um, and, 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 and I remember this lurid description um, of, well, you know, people are burning in the lake of fire, and if a bird picked up a grain of sand and flew over and dropped it on a mountain and then flew back and picked up another grain of sand, then when the mountain was all completely eroded, you wouldn't have even got started. They're still burning. And like this was, this was like the kind of stuff they told me growing up. And, um, and uh, one time, you know, people don't usually actually talk about this stuff very much. Um, and one time, I, was, I, I had a conversation with a client on the phone, and um, he had this kind of, I could tell something was bugging him, and we're talking about this business thing, and, then, and he goes, Perry, can I ask you a totally different question? And I go, sure. And he goes, man, like, I am just really messed up about hell. And, it, like, he was basically bringing up this exact same kind of thing. And this is, like, killing him. And I, and, I, and I was like, and I told him, I said, well, you know what? I've actually, I've not talked to very many people about this, but I've, um, I've like, 
I've had the same kind of train of thought that you're having because like I was brought up in this like really punitive kind of thing. And um, well, I've, uh, I've looked into this issue um, and um, I wanna read you something that I think is the starting point so one of, the, one of the things about getting to the bottom of a swamp is figuring out, well, where do you begin when you are asking a question like this, okay? And I think I have a really good answer, okay? Um, and just give me a second because I need to find, um, find this. Okay, so Genesis 3, this is the Adam and Eve story, and for the purpose of this conversation, I couldn't care less if you think this is a literally true story or if you think it's allegorical or whatever else. I don't care. I don't think it matters. But so this is Genesis 3, Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and they sin, and now all of a sudden they're ashamed, and he's blaming her, and she's blaming him, and like paradise goes spiraling down the toilet. Okay, well, now listen to this. So the Lord God made garments from skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Now that the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God expelled him from the orchard in Eden to cultivate the ground from which he had been taken. When he drove the man out, he placed on the eastern side of the orchard in Eden angelic sentries who used the flame of a whirling sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Here's what I get out of that little piece here. Um, what this is saying is that the worst thing that you could ever have in a fallen state is immortality. And what this is saying to me is that got taken off the table. And then the tree of life appears in the book of Revelation so that the nations can eat from it in this beautiful poetic passage. Now, this is interesting because it, uh, let's talk about these books again. So one of the things you can do with a set of books like this is you can trace the evolution of certain ideas throughout Christian history. And you know what I discovered? Hell inflation. So... 100 AD, 200 AD, it's ambiguous. The New Testament's very ambiguous about this. I mean, it really is. And um, the only two passages that sound like they're making some definitive statement about, you know, hell being this, you know, torturing people for everything is in the book of Revelation. But it's referencing the book of Ezekiel. And then if you go look at the book of Ezekiel, it's talking about a city in ruins that never gets rebuilt. Okay, so I don't think there's a very good case to be made from the New Testament for this kind of lurid, you know. And, 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 and okay, make no mistake. Like, these ideas seep into our society, and they don't get questioned by people, and they just sort of get baked into the culture. Okay, and what do they do? They color people's ideas about God. Okay, now, when I started discovering memos from the head office or the prophetic, as it's normally called, the first thing that I really noticed was the, the extreme kindness of God. People are so hard on themselves. There's a video, some of you might have seen it, I put it on my website, 
but it's this this lady named Abby Stumble. She 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 gets she gets a woman on stage, and then she starts talking to her the way that people talk to themselves. You're so stupid. You're so incompetent. You know, and you're ugly, and you have all the wrong answers, and your husband's a jerk. You know, and like. You know, and she's just like pummeling this woman with all these insults. And, and, she, and she goes, that's like most of our self-talk. You would never treat other people the way we treat ourselves. And what I discovered in, in, in the world of memos is God is not like that. Totally the opposite. Like when people get on the memos calls, a lot of times they're like, oh, I'm sure they're going to find some sin lurking in my soul and tell everybody about it. It's like, no, that's like not, that's not the point. Like, yeah, I know we're like all screwed up. Like we can all agree about that. That's not the focus. That's not what God is about. Now, hell inflation, first couple hundred years, it's like, ambiguous, just like the Gospels are. And then, well, then you get to about four or 500 AD and some guy's talking about, so God causes their skin to grow back as it burns and then so that they can never escape the fire of the judgment of God. And, and then you get to the Middle Ages and they're talking about um, they're talking about people going from fire to ice to fire to ice. Like it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, and you, know, you know what this is? This is just the worst instincts and the, mo- the basest human behavior projected onto God. God is not nearly as bad as most humans. Okay? Like... If, if God was like they told me in Sunday school and high school youth group, the gospel would be bad news. And this was like con- uh, a cognitive dissonance. It was like, hey, you know, we got this good news that you don't have to burn in hell forever and ever and ever. Well, I don't know. This kind of starts with one leg in a deep hole, doesn't it? You know? Like, we're really lucky that we might not have to do this. And um, look, okay, so let's put this in proper perspective. So my dear friend Tom Hubiar died in 2011. Tom Tom was dating Vicky, who he later married, and they're walking down the street one day, and Vicky goes, Tom, do you believe in hell? And he goes, yes, and it starts early. I'll be darned, that is such the smartest statement. And look, you know, I do believe in hell. Like, I I was like, oh, you know, you didn't get enough misery in this life and you want to sign up for some more? Like, nobody's going to stop (laughs) you. Okay, like, seriously, like, so in Sozo sessions, Sozo sessions is basically a facilitated meditation where... You're listening to the head office, and it's you hearing it, not somebody else, okay? And and one of the things that I learned from doing a bunch of these is God will not mess with your belief system if you don't want him to. It's sacred. God will not manipulate you to the extent that a human would. I have experienced this over and over again. If I have a bad belief, I have to willingly surrender it, and I have to want to get rid of it. He is not going to take um, a sledgehammer and pry it out of my hands. The highest value of God is human freedom and free will. God will not violate your free will. Won't do it. Refuses to do it. Now, that necessitates that people, by choice, live in hell every day. Because it's up to us. You want to live in hell? It's free country. You want to not live in hell? God will take you in a hot second. 
And, and, and so I, I, re I really think we've messed up a lot of things, and we've turned God into this god-awful tyrant, you know, with a beard and maybe a computer keyboard and who knows what else. And, like, that is, that is just not my experience. Um, and um, so, let's see. There's probably got to be a couple other things. And, yeah, we will get Shannon. Can I get you up here, Shannon? Yeah. Are you okay with that? Um, give me a minute, and I'll, I'll bring you up. Somebody give her a microphone. Well... I don't know. I mean, look, our fr look, our free will. Look, if um, well, we don't have time to go deep into this, but I'll just give you a really short answer. Okay, our our will is pressed upon by all kinds of forces, right? You're hungry. You're tired. You know. You're thirsty. Bad time to have an argument with your wife, right? Um, you get some alcohol, that makes it a little worse, right? Well, you can stack all kinds of forces, you know, and statistically, eventually, you know, we're going to give in to stuff at some point, right? But at the core, there is like, there is a choice of what we're going to do. Are we going to stop at the stop sign? Or are we going to run the red light and all of that, okay? And I... The only way we can be held accountable um, for this um, it, it is, is if we're actually free. But let's understand that, that the spirit can become imprisoned by the soul and the body. I mean, that's what an addiction is. Okay? So I think of a healthy human as spirit's on top, soul is next. That's like the emotions. And then you got the body and like... That should be the order of command. You get a heroin addict, the thing's completely upside down. The body and the hormones and everything is in charge. And like, you know, like um, the inmates are running the asylum. And, and like the person almost has no free will. And then, and then what you find with addiction programs is almost all of them are religious because it always takes some kind of a spiritual component to get that thing flipped upside down. I mean, it's just a fact. I mean, almost all successful addiction programs have, have a component like that. Let me see if there's like, like one like little other thing. Um, oh, okay. Um, Two little things and I'm done. So, oops, no, I wanted, here we go. All right, Luke chapter 23. All right, this, this is the the whole Christian message in like two paragraphs. <clears throat> One of the criminals who was hanging there railed at him saying, aren't you the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we rightly so, for we are getting what we deserve for what we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in, in paradise. Okay. This is the fractal pattern of the whole entire human race right there. All right, so you got two thieves. They both got themselves in really bad trouble. All right, you've got the Son of God who has voluntarily put himself in the same situation as them but has done nothing wrong. And you've got two responses. Response A, F-bombs. Get me, hey, you know, who are you, who you think you are? Get us out of here, right? The guy's still in denial? Like, hello, like, hasn't this taught you anything? Like, have things got bad enough? And the other, and the, the other guy even says to him, what, do you want to go to hell? Like, is this hell not bad enough for you? Like, you want more? I'm sure there's more. Like, if you go read, if you go read, 
um, like life after death stories, there's bad ones too. They don't talk about them, but you go look at, go look for them. You'll find them. Which way do you want it? It's up to you. He's like, oh, you want uh, you want more of this? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you want you're really a glutton for punishment. It's like Jesus, just can, can we like, can we just take a pass on the rest of? It's like you're on. It's like that's it. Okay, now if he. You know, if he's gonna li- then if he was gonna keep living, then he would need to go change his life and not live in hell anymore. Okay, and like that's a whole nother thing. But like, it, it was free for the asking. It was free for the asking. Um, so, um, usually when people give talks like this, they do like some kind of altar call. I am not gonna do that. And 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 and. Uh, and, and another thing they tend to do is like there's some peer pressure thing. Like, well, I want to, to, to raise your hand or something. I don't, I, I don't want any of that. Here's what I want. Your challenge, what, the way I would like to challenge you, your, uh, your challenge, should, should you choose to accept it, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is... to pursue the truth at all costs, wherever it takes you. Now, I believe the truth is a person, okay? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You might not be there yet. You might have questions about it. Fine. I like that DMZ thing anyway. That works great for me, okay? But... I would like you to decide, I am going to pursue the truth at all costs, and I do not want, I am always going to seek God instead of my idea of God, and I just realize that my idea of God is always less than what God actually is. And I don't want a show of hands or any of that peer pressure kind of stuff. I would just like you to decide that that is what I am going to do. Because the truth will set you free. 